Here, read this. Woof. Okay, two quick film reviews for you. Uh, two films I've seen quite recently that have connections to the podcast. The first one being The Bell Jar from 1979. I finally watched it from start to finish. I've, I've watched scenes here and there. Uh, a bit like the last film I talked about, Sylvia, this has quite a notorious reputation amongst uh, Plath fans. But um, yeah, I finally watched it properly. It's directed by someone called Larry Pierce, and it stars Marilyn Hassett as Esther Greenwood. Um, the version that I watched, which was on YouTube, is um, really dreadful quality. I'm not sure if the film print is actually in as bad a quality as that, or if this is just a, sort of a, a VHS transfer or something. But you can tell um, it's not exactly a, a high-budget production. It, it looks quite Lifetime movie-ish, quite corny. Uh, a lot of the scenes are sort of set up the same way, so it has this slightly stage play sort of feel to it. Which I don't actually think is all that bad. I, th there is a there is an amdram sort of quality to some of the scenes, a really melodramatic quality that uh, I think gets the most out of some scenes. I thought the the scene with Buddy Willard, uh, Esther's boyfriend, it's a famous scene for anyone who knows the Bell Jar, in which uh, Buddy undresses and presents his uh, naked form to Esther, who is famously. Um, Put off by the sight of he, the turkey neck and turkey gizzards that she is presented with and she leaves feeling faintly depressed. That scene is really uncomfortable and convincing. It, it's not really uncomfortable in oh ha ha the actors are rubbish and the script's rubbish and so it, it ends up being so bad it's good. I, I actually think it's a really well done scene in the film. You, f you, you, you know where both characters are coming from and they're on completely different pages. Not handled as well, Buddy Willard come, could come off like a, you know, a, a sort of seasoned predator, um, someone who's forcing himself on his on his girlfriend, when the whole point is he's a, he's a naive, uh, he's not a virgin because he's he's been with an older woman once, but he's a he's pretty much a virgin. He's not a very experienced young man, and he is by default he carries the the, the sexism of the times. Esther, in, in the meantime, is like completely bewildered by by this happening. She's curious, but also repulsed. And I think the performances of the two actors in the, in that scene is is really really good. I would I would I would um, if you're reading the Bell Jar and you get to that scene, I would I would honestly recommend you go and watch the way they do that scene because I I was really surprised by how uncomfortable in the all the right ways it felt. Um, there's other things I really liked about it. The, the thing that jumped out most was if the Bell Jar ever does get remade, and it is weird that it never has. It's it's bizarre that in the last sort of ten years there hasn't been a stab at the Bell Jar. You would think a uh, a film production company would go. This is one of the most popular novels going, and it wouldn't be super expensive to produce. Um, I know there's been several run ups at it, and there's been a TV show or something possibly still in the works. Um, but if it was remade, I have no doubt whatsoever it would be made more as a biopic of Plath at that time. Esther Greenwood is, uh, you know, lives through the same events that Plath did. She also attempts suicide. She also goes to work at a magazine in New York. She also, you know, the, the various analogues to Plath's life, but it's a novel an artistic expression of that time. It is not straight autobiography. If they made a film now, I'm sure they would make it as if it was really a slice of Plath's life, as if we all know it's Plath really, and the novel doesn't really matter. The novel is just um, the way Plath wrote down what happened to her. What I liked about this film, for all its clumsiness and all of its some really bizarre decisions, it doesn't treat the bell jar like just Plath's biography. It really does treat it like a novel. There are lots of really unreal moments, like the the opening, in which they, um, I think they read they read the poem "Mad Girl's Love Song." So okay, they're they're including Plath's poetry from outside of um, of the Bell Jar, but the, but it's written as if Esther Greenwood wrote it. But they play that over the credits, and they also have Esther address the viewer directly, um, immediately. You know, breaking the fourth wall. There's this sort of creepy music playing that's sort of a almost a horror movie type feel. I thought those moments were 
were terrific. And I really hope that if if the Bell Jars ever remade, they do some figurative stuff like that uh, and don't just go for documentary realism. Because although the Bell Jar is social history, slice of 50s life, uh, first person narrator, it's, there's nothing, you know, supernatural happens in it or whatever, that doesn't describe the mood of the novel. And I, I think doing bold, reality-breaking things like that um, helps the the sense of unreality that, that Esther ends up feeling after all of the terrible things that are done to her. Other bits I really liked, there, there were the, some really subtle touches, I thought. There was a moment where Esther's leaving to go to uh, work at the magazine. Um, I can't remember if it's called Mademoiselle in the film. But anyway, she she goes to the, to the magazine. She's describing before she gets there how she is feeling fragmented. And then in the next shot, she's turning up in New York and there's sort of 10 or 12 other young women who are going to work on the magazine who all look like her. They're sort of the same height, blonde. Um, so it's like her sense of psychological fragmentation is immediately physically represented by these 10 other Esters. Um, I thought that was a really good moment. And the whole, I'm going to just call it Mademoiselle, Mademoiselle sequence, I think had some of the best writing and best acting. There was there was a really arch sense of fun around that. There was a great line where she's talking about the poets that she likes and the editor is going, oh, these old fuddy-duddies or something, they're just old farts. And Esther says, uh, Yates is not a fart. I love the way the actress delivered that. Some of it's not so good. So I, I particularly thought the scenes with Esther and her mother felt like the actors were told to improvise their feel their way and um they did a they did a valiant job but it, it there was a sort of stubbornness to how the camera just sort of stayed on them and just waited for them to sort of resolve a scene and because of how they depict Esther's madness which is it's quite a lot um you know she's she's almost like as if she's possessed at some points which you know there's something you could potentially explore there there's pos possession isn't something that doesn't totally fit with a lot of Platt's writing, but it, it felt like too much. It felt it felt silly um, and not deliberately silly. It, she was sort of screaming. She was banging her head against a wall. She was, um, you know, zombified. Um, though maybe <clears throat> maybe what it was is that there the, the wasn't enough of that. Uh, the sense of her being trapped in a bell jar, I suppose, of of her uh, tamping it all down. She went big pretty early. Um, and those scenes with her mother are sort of just like, almost like we just needed to get this on camera quickly, but wrap it up. Um, so they felt particularly amdrammy or lifestyle movie-ish. And, and that, that did give them a sort of silliness that I don't think they quite intended. It is a pretty sloppy and rough film, but I think there's enough in it to make it worthwhile for Plath fans. Um, you get to see enough moments, like there is the Electra on Azalea path moment, going to visit the father's grave. I thought there was a really satisfying conclusion to the buddy story. Those actors, we know we see them together right at the start and right at the end. And um, I thought that was really, really well done. But yeah, it's not one I would recommend to people who aren't like really into the bell jar, really into Plath. And so they, you know, it's, it's going to be kill or cure. You're either going to hate it because you're really into Plath and you see all the things they, they do that offend you or you're gonna love it because at least you're seeing visual representation of certain things on screen, certain moments, um, and in my opinion, certain moments they actually do pretty well, despite most of it. Um, it is all on YouTube, I'll link it below. Worth a watch on those grounds. It, it's a it's a highly um, asterisked recommendation. Um, the second film I watched, just to completely change key, is The Body Snatcher from 1945. Uh, I have seen this before, but um, I realize I've never actually spoken about it. The connection here is I have done a podcast a long time ago now on The Body Snatcher, the short story by Robert Louis Stevenson. Um, this is a terrific film, highly recommend, and it's also available to, free, uh, to watch for free. I found it on archive.org. It's directed by Robert Wise, which I'd forgotten. Robert Wise made, um, directed Star Trek The Motion Picture which itself spawned one of my favorite book titles ever, which is Star Trek, the motion picture, a novel. Um, it stars Boris Karloff, Bella Lugosi, Russell Wade, and Henry Daniel. 
And it broadly follows Stevenson's story. So Stevenson's story is the story of a young med- medical student who gets wrapped up in a, in a sort of body snatching um, operation, rather like that of uh, Dr. Knox in real life. In the story, Dr. Knox is sort of pulling the strings. He's referred to as Dr. K, someone I can't possibly name in full. I think he's at the sort of the top of the pyramid and Wolf McFarland and Fetties are the two students that are sort of doing his bidding for him, taking deliveries of the bodies. Um, and yet Burke and Hare's already happened. So maybe Dr. K is still living on in Edinburgh in disgrace in Stevenson's story. Slightly different here. Interestingly, a bit like the Belgian movie, including poetry from Plath's life, it, uh, this film also sort of expands on its source's wider context. Um, Knox has already happened. He's referred to, his name is said in full, his infamy is in full, um, so that there is more of a, a fully articulated precedent of Knox and Burke and Hare. So that gives this film a lot of the um, nastiness and innuendo of everything that's going on. There's there's just a wonderfully sort of squalid, dirty joke feeling to it. Um, there's a bunch of stiff people in the medical establishment, stiff, no pun intended, who know exactly how this looks but needs need to keep a straight face some things are changed so the story has it, stevenson's story is told in like a frame story so we uh, we see fetties and mcfarland run into each other and everything is remembered um here we we don't bother with the frame and we start and in a way that's a shame because you don't get to um you know slowly unravel the horror like you do in stevenson's story um but you get to see the antagonism between Wolf McFarland and the body snatcher, who is played by Boris Karloff. And spending more time with those two means the job to, the, the film does quite a sophisticated job of showing how, in a different sort of way, uh, the, the uh, Boris Karloff's character has, you know, snatched um, Wolf McFarland's life from him. He, he's sort of become dependent on this horrible, um, uh, sinister figure. Who has all this dirt on him because uh, he's complicit in in the in this body snatching, and that's a side that's sort of more implied in in Stevenson's story, but we we get to see it sort of develop here, which is really good. Fetties is an American student in the film who um, injects a little heroism into it. The Stevenson story is much bleaker. There isn't much <laughs> of a of a happy ending. The film comes up with one, which is actually a um, whilst being a sort of uh, here's the happy bit plonked on um they do actually come up with something that's th- th- thematically interesting it's the story of a, a young girl who's lost the ability to use her legs needs operating on by mcfarlane and um so another kind of having having one's body snatched and uh you know potentially returned but i'm focusing on the wood and not the trees here that's that's sort of the the wider picture this film is all about really boris karloff fantastic performance supercilious um grotesque leery um charismatic i, I keep all i can think of is gallows humor which sounds like a silly joke but it it is just rampant gallows humor from start to finish um it's a really funny film nastily funny um, perhaps the, f- the funniest thing that happens in it is in the first scene we see uh, Fetties in Greyfriars Kirkyard um, interacting with a dog that's clearly mo- mo- modelled on Greyfriars Bobby. It's called Robbie and they're in Greyfriars Kirkyard. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Greyfriars Bobby is sort of like um, Edinburgh's favourite dog. There is a statue of Greyfriars Bobby. There is a, a story in which uh, Greyfriars Bobby... Um, sat loyally on his uh, master's grave and all, all the tourists love to come and, and stroke his nose um one of the funniest things that and i'll spoil this but it's really early on it happens happens in the opening like 10 minutes <laughs> is uh one of the first things that happens in the body snatcher is that boris karloff kills grey <laughs> grey bobby with a spade he's just in the way when he's trying to snatch a body perhaps it's old jock um no it's not and he just clubs Greyfriars Bobby to death. Um, and I wonder if the if the filmmakers knew how much Greyfriars Bobby means to Edinburgh. It's weirdly shocking to see it on screen. It's a bit like starting a, a film set in London and the first thing that happens is Paddington Bear is stabbed to death or something. 
but it's done in a kind of like <laughs> sort of way. I'd forgotten that happened and I just thought it was uh, hilarious. I should say it's told in shadow. It's not, it's nothing, nothing gory or anything like that. Especially right now during Edinburgh Fringe where there is so much, isn't Edinburgh great feeling and, and lots of tourist gush floating around. To see Greyfriars Bobby just get dispatched with a spade by Boris Karloff, uh, it was just the tonic I needed to be honest. Um, and I love dogs. I I would never want to see a, a, a dog harmed in any way possible. But um, that got me. That really got me. So yes, a uh, thorough recommendation for The Body Snatcher. Terrific film. Obviously, its its main selling point at the time was the pairing of Boris Karloff and Bela Lugosi. They had worked together in, in the past, the great universal legends. Um, Bela Lugosi is in it a lot less. So let me just take, let me just temper your expectations. It's really Boris Karloff's film. And then uh, Fetty's and Wolf McFarland in particular get a lot more screen time. The, f the best acting scenes I think are Karloff and Henry Daniel playing uh, Wolf McFarland, who's a terrific um, regal sounding actor. He's, he's a perfect uh, foil to, to Karloff. Um, Bella Lugosi, I, I believe was ill for the filming and he's, He's really barely in it, um, but they do have one scene together, which is uh, very memorable. Yeah, thoroughly recommend that. Sort of recommend the Bell Jar if if you're a you know studying Plath either in a academic or just for personal pleasure sort of way, and you want to see certain scenes represented, and some things done in an interesting way. But yeah, it is it is quite a shoddy film altogether. Unlike the Body Snatcher, which is great, go and watch it. I'll link the archive.org link uh, below. Okay, I think that's it for today. Two sort of slightly disconnected uh, film recommendations. The connection being, of course, the I read this podcast. I'll link both the podcasts below as well. Cheers, that's it for now. Bye. <laughs>